Okay, <clears throat> hello all. I'm uh, Didier Stevens, and uh, this will be uh, a presentation about malware, uh, an introduction to, to malware. Uh, presentations with slides, but I also have uh, a couple of demos uh, at the end, simple ways to, uh, to analyze uh, malware. So um, I'm Didier Stevens, I work for Enviso, and uh, I've been doing uh, malware uh, analysis for, for quite some time. Um, after the Y2K project, I started uh, doing uh, malware analysis in, uh, in companies, in financial companies. I also work in the SANS Internet uh, Storm Center as a handler. So uh, from day to day, uh, sometimes I will log on and uh, write a diary and handle uh, everything that is thrown at us. <laughs> yeah? Is that crazy German still run the ISC? He does, yeah. Please give <laughs> I will. He was just uh, in Brussels a month or two ago, I think, for the SANS training. So, and uh, okay, if you have questions, uh, just shout. Uh, you don't have to wait till, uh, till the end of the presentation. That's why uh, I have this slide here. You can just start with asking questions uh, like uh, Jim did, no problem at all. Just shout. So a day in the life of, uh, of a malware analyst. Now you have uh, several types of, uh, of malware analysts. Um, I'm not going to talk about a malware analyst who works for, uh, for an antivirus company, because that's uh, not what I did. Uh, I'm going to talk about what, what I do, what I did, and that is working as a, as a malware analyst in a large corporation uh, that receives a lot of malware and uh, has to handle it. Now this is a kind of informal life cycle of what could be a, a typical day of a malware analyst. So you say, okay, malware analyst, he, he analyzes malware, okay? But uh, it doesn't always start like that, just analyze malware, yeah? The first thing is, in a normal cycle like this, is that uh, as an analyst, you will be informed that malware has been detected, okay? And I'm saying here potential malware because maybe it, it is not malware. Huh? But as an analyst, you, you are informed that uh, something could have happened. And the question is that you uh, take a look at that. Now, next step is to uh, decide if you are going to analyze that malware or not. Uh, that, that can sound strange, but uh, you have limited resources. I mean, analyzing malware is uh, expensive, it takes time. So you have to decide what you are going to analyze. Then of course, you analyze the malware, and when you have done that, you will probably take some actions. For example, uh, say that uh, a machine has to be rebuilt. That's a, a possible action. So first of all, I'm informed that uh, malware is detected, potential malware. So what, what is malware? According to this uh, definition from Newman, eh, malicious software is, uh, so malware, is software that is intentionally included or inserted in a computer system for a harmful purpose. Okay, so malware is malicious. Yeah? Okay, now that's already subjective. Uh, I mean, in most of the cases, okay, we can clearly say this is malware, but uh, there are borderline cases and that you will have a program and that it's not always obvious if it is really malware or not. For example, uh, a software that will just display a couple of pop-ups. Uh, it, it might be annoying, 
But to some people, they will say, okay, that's not real malware. Because it doesn't actually do something malicious. It is just annoying me. To understand that the, the line is not always clear. And to help me uh, with that, I look uh, at this method in, uh, in security. And the method is where that you focus on uh, confidentiality, integrity, and uh, availability of, uh, of systems data. Right? That's probably something you already have uh, encountered. And uh, you can use that as a, as a touchstone to see if the potential malware that you encountered eh, changes one of those parameters. Uh, for, for example, if we are talking about uh, ransomware, eh, so malware that will encrypt your personal files and hold them for ransom, eh, that will do something to the availability of your files. Eh? Your, your files are no longer uh, available. Okay? And, and with this definition, with this uh, CIA um, definition, we can say, okay, it has an impact on availability, so it has an impact on that security of my system, so I consider it malware. I don't know if you have an idea how many malware samples um, there are, but it's a huge number. Nowadays, we are talking about uh, billions of samples, uh, different pieces uh, of, of malware. And it's uh, always growing. So it, it's impossible for uh, someone to know uh, all the malware that is around, even, even all the malware families. Uh, there are so many families. So a, a malware family hmm, is uh, a group of software that is uh, malicious, malware and that uh, behaves uh, mostly the same for the different executors, the different samples that you find in that, uh, in that family. So uh, knowing, for example, CryptoLocker. Yeah, maybe you've heard about CryptoLocker. Mm -hmm. CryptoLocker is a, is a family of uh, ransomware. Yeah? Just also to know all the different uh, Malware samples, malware sample families, is uh, impossible. There are so many. Things that make it also a bit more difficult when, when I'm talking about this here is that um, the different antivirus companies will sometimes use different names for, for the same samples. It, it's not actually the, the malware routers that decide how, how they name their, uh, their malware. They, they would like that. But uh, often, it's the antivirus company uh, who decides uh, on the name. It uh, often is done by finding a couple of strings in, uh, in the executable and then putting them together or reversing some of them. Okay, and that gives you the name of uh, the malware uh, or the malware family. And uh, there are hundreds of antivirus companies so they don't always talk together to uh, give the same name to the same sample, so you end up with, uh, with different names. So that makes also the families, the set of families to appear larger, right, because there are samples in there with uh, families that have different names. Okay, so now that uh, we have a working definition of uh, what malware is. Uh, it's something malicious, okay. But how do you define malicious? Okay, you uh, test it with the CIA. So now that we are in that position, how can we get informed as a, as a malware analyst that malware has been detected? Well, uh, a typical case, of course, is that antivirus will detect it and alert you, okay? And you have, for example, antivirus running on a workstation, uh, uh, this machine, or running on a server uh, somewhere in the data center. 
But there are also other uh, devices and network devices that can uh, have antivirus. For example, the proxy server. Uh, proxy servers can also run antivirus devices. And for example, when they download a file, the file will be scanned by the antivirus on the proxy before it is passed on to uh, the client. Mail servers, for example. Yeah? Mail servers also have often uh, an antivirus so that they scan the messages and also the attachments. Mm. Typically, those devices, when they find something, they will just remove it and maybe inform the user that something was removed, but typically they will uh, remove it. Okay, so that is the, the antivirus. And of course, the question, as a, as a malware analyst, why would you care about uh, antivirus detections and, and start maybe uh, analyzing the malware that was detected? Okay. Well, the thing is, when uh, antivirus has detected something, it, it will remove it. Yeah? But you are never sure with, uh, with most of antivirus programs if the malware that was uh, just detected, if that malware just arrived on the machine, uh, was, for example, downloaded to the machine, detected by the antivirus, and then removed, or that it was another case, that the malware was already present on the machine. Uh, the malware has been downloaded on the machine, but it was not detected by the antivirus. Okay? So it was able to work, operate on that machine. And, for example, a week later, when uh, the antivirus receives signatures that are more up-to-date, uh, so definitions of, uh, that help it to find anti-malware, definitions that are more up-to-date so that it can find that sample, yeah. then you can also get an alert. So the malware has been active for a week, and after a week you get an alert by the antivirus. Yeah. It's often hard to distinguish, distinguish those uh, two cases when you just receive antivirus alerts. Because often it will say, okay, there was a file, I detected it, that is a family, delete it. Okay. But that is a big difference. Eh? I mean, malware just downloaded on a machine, not executed, detected, deleted. Eh? Almost nothing happened. While malware was active for a week and only then detected. Yeah. So in that second case, you want to know what that malware did to the machine, and, and maybe more, maybe to, to the network and, uh, and all the connected devices. Now, the antivirus companies will not help you a lot with that to figure out what, uh, what the malware does. Uh, Many antivirus companies have a kind of library where you can look up the detection name and see what uh, the malware does, but that's uh, often a description from a high level. Uh, for example, they could say it's a password stealer. It, it steals passwords. But if you, are, if you are in a corporate environment, um, it's important to know, for example, if you are dealing with a password stealer, if it will, what kind of passwords it tries to steal. Right? For example, is it uh, trying to steal a Facebook uh, credentials? <coughs> or is it trying to steal corporate credentials? Yeah. So that is where uh, a malware analyst can help. In that case where something has been active on the machine, we need to look into more detail to see what could have been done to that machine. So that's one case, the uh, antivirus that uh, detects something. Then it should, could just be also a, a suspicious file. Uh, an administrator is uh, working on a, on a server, he's uh, on the disk, and uh, he finds a file that he doesn't recognize. I mean, he doesn't expect the file to be there. He doesn't know what the file does. So it's something we have to look into. At that, here, at this moment, we don't even know it if it is uh, malicious. Uh, this is something uh, potentially malicious. Yeah. 
same for emails. Uh, we, we get a lot of uh, emails, and uh, many of them also malicious, if, uh, if you're not lucky, if you get a lot of spam. So that's another case uh, that could be the start of an investigation. And then sometimes it, it, it is just strange behavior. Uh, you, have a, you have an administrator that uh, works on a server, and he just has the feeling that something is wrong with that server. For example, uh, because of performance, he thinks that, uh, that the machine is not operating fast enough, that it is slowish. And, and sometimes it happens that administrators then think, OK, there's a virus on it. And that's the reason why the server is behaving like that. And that, that then something to investigate. Could also be, for example, strange network connections. But all those things, of course, uh, depend on the skills uh, of, the of the person that is reporting that, and also of, of the experience that the, that the uh, server, sorry, that the administrator has with that server. Because I can guarantee you, if you open uh, a tab with the network connections of any machine, you will see a lot of connections. And it isn't always uh, obvious what could be uh, suspicious or not. Uh, so you have uh, administrators that are easily alert, uh, alarmed by what they see. Hmm. Talking about performance, uh, that is something that happened a lot uh, in the past when, uh, when we were dealing with uh, CPUs when, with one core hmm. uh, on workstations uh, or even on servers. Because if the malware was then taking up all the resources of the CPU. <laughs> you would have 100% uh, CPU utilization, and uh, the performance of the machine would go way down. But, but nowadays, with uh, multiprocessor and uh, multi-core machines, that is something that tends to happen less, that you get the impression, OK, the machine is uh, slowish, or there is a, a performance problem. Because even if the malware is not uh, behaving like uh, it should, not taking too many resources. Say that it is using all the CPU, uh, sorry, all the processing power of one core, and, and you have a, a normal machine with, with four cores, for example, well, that only takes 25%. Right? And often, when your machine is consuming 25%, you will not uh, notice anything strange about the uh, performance for that machine. So for the antivirus, we are, we are talking about uh, detection. Uh, and we talk about uh, positives and negatives, just like in, in medical te tests. Yeah? You have a positive detection or a, or a negative detection. And uh, in both cases, of course, <coughs> the device that does the detection can be wrong. Here, the antivirus, it could uh, flag something as positive eh, as being a malware, but it's actually not a malware, and we call that a, a false positive. Another case, malware that is uh, not detected. Eh? There is malware on the machine, the antivirus does not see it, eh, like I had that example with that machine for over a week. Eh? The antivirus did not detect it, that is a false negative, eh? a negative detection, but it's an error because the malware is there, false negative. And then, of course, the things we prefer, true positive and true negative. As a user, you will probably prefer the true negative. As a malware analyst, I can get some joy in a, in a true positive. So. The example of the malware that was not initially detected, that was a false negative, that then later became a true positive. Uh, so that's already bad. Uh, malware is on the machine, and it was uh, not detected. But uh, a false positive can also have uh, serious implications uh, for the operations in a, 
in an organization like a, like a company, but also for, for uh, home users. Unfortunately, uh, it, had ha it has happened a couple of times that antivirus vendors make a serious mistake in uh, their definitions. They, every day they create new definitions to detect new malware and they push that out to, to the antivirus that is deployed uh, on the premises of their clients. Well, sometimes they make a mistake and it has happened a couple of times with serious consequences. For example, uh, McAfee, one of the antivirus vendors, has had a false positive a couple of years ago where it would falsely, so a false positive, falsely detect a malware in an essential component of Windows and then also remove that uh, component. The result was that the machine was no, running, no longer running that stable. Yeah. It restarted and then it was even unable to reboot. Yeah. And uh, handling those kinds of cases, well, it all depends on uh, how well your administrators are, are trained and prepared to handle uh, a complete set of servers that goes down because, uh, because of false positives. Yeah. If you are lucky, it is just restoring the file that was accidentally deleted at the false positive and then reboot the machine. But it can be harder to uh, restore, especially if you no longer have uh, remote access to the machine uh, because it's completely done. Home users, that is often uh, a big problem. Eh? They have a false positive on their machine. Their machine no longer boots. If they don't have somebody in the family who understands about this, or a neighbor, they, uh, they tend to buy a new machine because it no longer works. Uh, the antivirus company can help them, but the antivirus company can just give instructions what to do. And if your machine no longer boots, it can be, uh, in the end, too difficult uh, to get it running again. So that is... Important to know, you have detections, positive and negative, but uh, they can also be wrong, false and true. And also because we are here in a in university setting, I, I also wanted just to, uh, to touch on this. And um, you know about the halting problem, uh, the, the stop problem, and that, that the program, that it, it's not possible to write a program that can decide if another program will stop or not. Uh, that's, a, that's a halting problem. Hmm. Now, Fred Cohen, uh, with a, a malware researcher, and in those, ta in those days we didn't speak about malware, we spoke about uh, viruses. So what, what he's, uh, he's actually talking about viruses. Uh, but, but I paraphrased him and I'm talking about malware. Uh, viruses are just uh, a subset of, of malware. Uh, viruses, they, they try to replicate, while not all malware tries to replicate. Now, in 1987, uh, Cohen was able to come up with a formal proof that Virus detection is actually a special case of the halting problem. So he was able to write out a formal proof that to detect a virus is actually the same as to decide if a program stops or not. And we know that with the halting problem, that that is impossible. So conclusion, for an antivirus, it is impossible to decide for all Malware, if it is malware or not. Not from a practical point of view, but from a theor theoretical point of view. Sorry? Yeah. Was it the, the picture not on the chair? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just thinking, I was confused with the name, Fred Cohen. It's Alan Turing that did halting problem. Oh, yes. Yeah, and uh, I had no picture of uh, Fred Cohen. <laughs> So 
So to come back to uh, our detection, this is typically uh, the kind of uh, detection, well, uh, it's not uh, actual detection, but it highlights the information that you will get in an alert uh, from the antivirus. First of all, there is a name for, uh, for the antivirus, w 32 slash corgo.worm.g. That information, if, if you know a bit about uh, antivirus alerts, already tells you some things. For example, W32 tells you that it is uh, malware targeting the Windows operating system, uh, W32. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is 32-bit. It could also be 64-bit. Huh? But in this case here, W32, I know, okay, this is targeting the um, Windows operating system. For example, it could also say uh, VBA. And then I know that it is a malicious office document that uses uh, Visual Basic for applications to uh, achieve its malicious goal. Corgo is, uh, is the name, the name that they came up with. Worm gives you an indication of uh, the type of malware you are dealing with. A worm is uh, something that will replicate uh, from machine to machine without requiring user interaction. Okay? So luckily we haven't seen uh, many of those uh, the last years, but uh, they could be quite devastating because they could spread in a, in a computer network without uh, any user interaction, without any human interaction. They could infect a complete set uh, of machines in that network and once they had um, infected that, uh, that set of machines, it could be very hard to uh, get rid of them. I mean, okay, you can remove it from ma one machine. That would not be too hard. But then all the other machines are still trying to infect that ma machine that you just cleaned. Right. So that's uh, the difficulty in this case. Dot G is just a, a letter they... Um, append to identify a, a different variant. Now you will get um, often the date and time of the incident, and that is always, almost always the date and time of the detection, yeah? not necessarily when the initial infection uh, happens, and uh, not the timestamp of uh, the file creation or things like that. It's often when it was detected. A computer name, eh, on which machine it happened. And then a uh, file name and a part. If you're lucky, you have the part. You know where, where it is, but, uh, but also a file name. So with this information, when you receive this as, as a malware analyst, you will uh, have to decide what to do with uh, that sample. Now, remark, I did not mention any uh, cryptographic hashes here, uh, like a, a SHA-2 or things like that. That's typically something you don't get in an alert, uh, something that would allow you to easily identify uh, the sample and, for example, see have I seen this before or not because it's the same cri cryptographic hash. Uh, well, often you don't get that information. Sometimes you, you can find it yourself in... Uh, in the metadata that is stored in, uh, in the alert. I mean, if you, if you go digging into that metadata, sometimes you will find it there, but uh, typically not in the alert. So I touched here upon a worm. Now let's just get uh, an overview of uh, different types of malware that you can find This here is just a small overview. It's, uh, I mean, several of the things here that appear, I, I put here on there because they are um, malware types that are very prevalent for the moment. Yeah. Other things are, are less prevalent. So you have, for example, viruses. 
viruses, that's what we talked about uh, 15 years ago, and when we were talking about malware, viruses. Yeah? Viruses, they will replicate, but they will typically need user interaction. And the user will need to do something for the virus to replicate. For example, if we are talking about a, a malicious executable, the, the user will have to execute, say open the executable, run it for the virus to try to replicate. And for example, replication could mean that it will append itself to other execu executables on that uh, machine. While a worm, uh, what we just discussed, can do that without user interaction. It will typically exploit a vulnerability, uh, a bug in the system. Uh, bugs in the system that can be misused to uh, achieve undesirable result, undesirable results, like for example, execute code. Exploit kits. That's something uh, we will look into more details. Uh, that's uh, something that is very prevalent uh, for several years now. An exploit kit is something that is put on a compromised server, typically a web server. So somebody compromised the web server. Eh? It uh, could achieve access to that server eh? mm -hmm. without having actually the right to access that server. And then an exploit kit was installed on that server. And it could be done manually, but it's also often uh, done um, automatically, where you have uh, machines that are scanning the internet for certain vulnerabilities finding it, exploiting it, and putting an exploit kit on it. An exploit kit, we will see that uh, later in, in detail, an exploit kit will try to infect your machine by trying to uh, take over your browser when you visit that website. That's what uh, an exploit kit does. Trojans are malicious executables that try to uh, pretend that they are something else. For example, a game, which is actually malware. And you can, sometimes you can play it as a game, but still it will also behave maliciously. That is something that Trojans that you will find often with uh, mobile malware. So malware that you will find on mobile devices like smartphones. On uh, Android, there's a, a huge set of um, samples that are malicious. Uh, there's a lot of malware for Android. And then something that uh, has gained again popularity the last couple of years, that's uh, a malicious document. Uh, a malicious document is a document that can uh, achieve code execution. So, so you would not expect it, um, opening a PDF or a, or a Word document, but the result is that code executes, unwanted code executes on your machine. Rootkits. Rootkits are uh, special types of malware. They will try to hide what they do. To try, the, try to hide their presence, for example, on a machine. Um, on a Windows machine, for example, a rootkit might install a, a driver in the kernel, and that driver, when it is requested to list all the files in a directory, will list all the files in a set directory, except if the executable of the rootkit is inside that folder. Then it will not list that particular file. Okay? So, by manipulating the kernel of uh, the operating system, it tries to mislead you, eh? tell you tells you f uh, false information. Uh, the file is not, there is no file there, or is, there is no registry entry there. Eh? It is hiding that. That's what a, a rootkit does. And uh, from an historical point of view, uh, rootkits actually uh, appeared uh, on Unix machines. Um, and that's why they are called rootkits, 
because once you achieved uh, root access on a Unix machine with a root kit, you could persist with your uh, root, root access on that machine. For example, a root kit, in, back in those days eh, on, on a Unix machine, a root kit, for example, would replace the ls command on a Unix machine. Eh? That you would do an ls to see the files, and then the ls command would just hide the files that are part of the rootkit, so that you don't see it. Eh? <laughs> and uh, we are not talking about the kernel here, eh? when we are talking about that, that that's just uh, the ls uh, program. Eh? So in the beginning, it was a, a set of programs, eh? a kit to uh, remain root on the machine and be able to hide what you, uh, was present on that machine. Ransomware, that's a big problem now. Ransomware is also malware that is uh, distributed, typically spammed via emails to users. And uh, what ransomware does, when it executes, it will look on your machine for your personal documents, like uh, Word documents, but also pictures, uh, music, things like that. Typically not executables, but typically documents, uh, private documents, things you care about. And then it will ransom them. So it will make that you can no longer access those documents and that you have to pay a ransom. So that you have to pay the authors, for example, in bitcoins, uh, a virtual currency that you have to pay them an amount, for example, one Bitcoin, which is already a large amount. Eh? Um, I think we are talking about five, six hundred euros uh, at the moment for it. Uh, Twelve hundred dollars today. Well, okay, that's a thousand ten today. So that's a large amount. Eh? And um, when you pay the ransom, often you will indeed recover your files. Uh, it, it is all done with cryptography. Uh, they, they encrypt your files, and uh, when you pay the ransom, they give you the key to, to decrypt it. Right? Super good yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, the, so indeed, the, the, the criminals that do that, they, they have to provide very good customer service. But they, very cryptography. they made a lot of mistakes to crypto, actually. I mean, there are very stories of lost keys, uh, bad crypto, they couldn't decrypt it anymore. Yeah, it has happened. So good customer service, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because if, if, yeah, if, you, if as a criminal you can, you can no longer guarantee that people will recover uh, their files, well, through word of mouth, they will know that for that particular sample, it uh, doesn't help to pay the ransom because your files uh, are lost. Right? So that's bad for uh, their business. And, and So that is ransomware, a big problem now. Also, one of the reasons why this is a, a big problem is that a lot of malware needs um, administrative access or, or root access to do something really malicious to your machine. But that is not the case for ransomware. Eh? Ransomware just needs the same access as you have to your files, and then it takes that access away. And that is uh, typically for... Um, the Windows and, uh, and the Linux and also the OS X model. If a machine, oh, sorry, if software like ransomware runs with your account, it has exactly the same rights as you have on that machine. So all the pictures that you have access to, it has also access to and can encrypt them. And then something that is also very prevalent now is uh, IoT malware, uh, Internet of Thing devices uh, malware. Like maybe if you've heard about uh, the Mihai botnet, uh, that's uh, a botnet that uh, has been used to uh, achieve distributed uh, denials of service attacks. Uh, 
Uh, so a denial of service attack is typically a huge set of requests, packets that are sent to a network device like a server, and that amount of traffic going to that server is so huge that the network and the server cannot cope with it. So the service is no longer available because it is overloaded, a denial of service. And distributed denial of service actually uh, just means that it is not one machine that is attacking that server, but that there are several other machines attacking that server. Mirai achieved this, and um, it's not working on workstations of users, but it is working on IoT devices. For example, web cameras, IP cameras, that uh, have been compromised, taken over, and then they are part of the botnet. Okay, so exploit kits. So an exploit kit, it's a malware that is installed on a compromised web server and the goal is to try to infect web clients. That's uh, the goal of an exploit kit. A well-known uh, example of exploit kit is uh, the black hole exploit kit. Exploit kits are typically, for example, written uh, in PHP. Python, ASP.NET. So, just a small overview. I, I don't think that's very readable, I'm sorry. So, the initial contact is that you will, for example, receive an email with a link to such a server that contains an exploit kit or you will visit a normal website and then be redirected to a website with an exploit kit, or you land immediately on a web server with uh, an exploit kit. For example, when you are on a normal website, it could be through malicious advertisement that you end up on a server with an exploit kit. So, those ads that uh, pop up on the servers, they can also be exploited. Now, when that happens, you are directed here to a traffic direction system. It's a, it's a server with a piece of malware that uh, will decide what the next step is, and to which other server will you be directed. And that happens, for example, with iframes or redirects. And then you end up here on the exploit server kit, which will try to take over your browser via vulnerabilities in the browser or in Flash or in Java or uh, PDF. Uh, an exploit kit will typically try out several exploits, see what is installed on your machine, what could possibly be vulnerable, and try to exploit that. That's what uh, an exploit kit will typically do. Uh, it's a, called a kit because it has several exploits uh, and tries it on your machine. And if it uh, achieves um, code execution on your machine, then it will uh, infect your machine with malware. Uh, for example, a banking trojan or a ransomware or, or other malware. Exploit kits are very prevalent for the moment uh, and have been for several years. A lot of users, when uh, they visit a website, they are redirected to something somewhere else and by clicking themselves on the link or just by uh, automatic redirection, for example, with an iframe, and then they end up on an exploit kit. If their machine is not up to date, it will be compromised. So 
So vulnerability, uh, that's what an exploit kit uh, exploits. A vulnerability is uh, actually a bug, just, a, a, just an error that was made in the programming of that system, it's a, it's a bug. But uh, it's, a, it's a special type of bug here in, in our case. It's a bug that you can misuse to uh, achieve code execution, okay? So typically, a bug would not allow you to uh, execute code. I mean, it's not in your um, right as a, as a web server, for example, to execute code on the client machine. But through that bug, which is, in this case, a vulnerability, code execution can uh, take place. And that is done through an exploit. Yeah? An, an exploit is a, a particular piece of code written to trigger that bug and make it the right circumstances so that code from that exploit can execute. So that is what... Uh, an exploit kit will do. It has several exploits, and like I said, for example, Flash, um, Java. And inside Flash, of course, several Flash and Java exploits. Then something that we have seen now for uh, more than two years being spammed a lot are uh, malicious documents. So those are uh, documents that uh, you receive via mail, and uh, they typically say, okay, this is an invoice that you need to open, or it's uh, a package that was delivered, and you missed it, so open this document here to, uh, to get a new delivery. Uh, so you are enticed to open uh, those documents. And typically, a document is not expected to execute code. But the malicious document contains malware just to uh, achieve code execution. And it can be done in several ways. Um, exploits, like I explained with exploit kits, that's something that can be uh, done, that's typically done for PDF. But uh, for office uh, documents, it can just be done through scripting. Uh, Microsoft Office documents, uh, they can contain VBA code, Visual Basic for Application. VBA code that runs inside the context of uh, Microsoft Word has the same rights as, as you do on that machine. And so there are, there's no need for exploits there. The scripting can do uh, everything. Of course, there are protections uh, in Microsoft Office that will warn you about the presence of uh, VBA code and it will not be executed automatically. Mm -hmm. But through social engineering, so here yeah, it's not that readable, but here you get a warning, that yellow bar, it's a warning uh, that this document contains microcode and that it did not execute and that you need to push the button for it uh, to execute, but that you have to be careful while while this here is then the social engineering by the attacker and by the, the criminal. This social engineering will tell you, for example, oh, this is a protected document, it's an encrypted document. And to see the content, uh, you need to push the yellow button. Yeah. That is something that started in uh, October, November 2014. Uh, it was already popular long ago um, in the early 2000s because then there were no protections at all, so that yellow bar and things like that did not exist. When you receive something like that and you opened it, it executes automatically without you being able to stop it. That has changed. Microsoft has made changes. But now, since um, October 2014, new campaigns have started where this is spammed, and it is still going on because it is um, successful. Yeah. Enough people are misled by this to open the document, get infected. Then ransomware. So it will restrict access to your computer and uh, demand that you pay a ransom. It is uh, typically done through encryption. 
And, and in the beginning, it was uh, easy and uh, trivial encryption that uh, if you knew something about uh, cryptography, you would be able to, to recover it. Uh, so, I mean, the files that had been ransomed, encrypted. But uh, nowadays, a lot of uh, ransomware is technically uh, completely sound. I mean, they use the proper cryptographic algorithms and the proper cryptographic protocols so that they can make sure that uh, they encrypt your files properly, that it is impossible to recover them without a key, and that they can also get the key without you being able to recover the key in the communication. Uh, for example, in, in the beginning, okay, it was, for example, done with AES. Uh, the files were properly encrypted with AES, and the encryption key was sent via HTTP to their command and control center. Uh, so if you were lucky, you could have somewhere a trace, a capture of that communication, and then recover the key. Uh, but uh, nowadays, that part of uh, the communication is also encrypted. Uh, they, they can use, of course, HTTPS, but they can also just hold their own uh, public key uh, crypto, I mean, to encrypt the, the symmetric key uh, with their public key and send it off to them. Ransomware, I say it, it's a big problem. Um, it has grown um, significantly. It's also uh, more than a year now that in different forums on the internet where people are helped uh, with computer problems, not only malware problems, but all kinds of computer problems, uh, those, those help forums. It has happened on a lot of those forums now that you have a dedicated forum, a dedicated uh, thread, uh, just for uh, ransomware. And you have people fighting, uh, fighting uh, the malware authors, and they develop, for example, um, tools to try to identify with what kind of ransomware that you are dealing, uh, to see if you are in a position to be helped or not. This will sometimes also occur with the help of the antivirus firmas. It has happened a couple of times that uh, antivirus firm, uh, companies were able to uh, strike back the criminals and that they were able to get on the servers, to break into the servers of the criminals and retrieve all the keys that have been uploaded to those servers. And then they would share those keys in the tools that they would make public or uh, on their own servers. And if you were in uh, such a case, then you could have your files decrypted for free by the help of that antivirus company. Uh, and, but to know that you are in such a case, uh, you also need those tools that, that help you to identify with what kind of uh, ransomware you are dealing with. Because in most cases, uh, it will not help you. Right? The, the thing that will help you is a backup, but an, an offline backup. Eh? <laughs> because nowadays, uh, ransomware will also try to remove your backups if, uh, if you make uh, backups and, and keep them on your machine or, uh, or another machine. I love, like, for example, shadow files. Uh, shadow files are uh, a kind of local backup done by Windows uh, on machines. Eh? So if you make uh, an error in a file, or if you delete it by accident, then you can ask Windows to recover a previous version. Eh? That's essentially the idea behind shadow files. Well, nowadays, ransomware will also interfere with those shadow files, and uh, typically remove them, so that you cannot use it to restore. Yeah? Yes. So if you would catch it in the act, you could, you're, you're safe, right? If you, catch it, so if you can catch it in the act. It seems, it seems to me intuitively that you would be able to notice somehow that all your files are suddenly being encrypted. Yeah, so they've seen some research on it. And so if they do some research on it, it's possible. The 
problem is the, the researchers I've seen, they, they say like, okay, we tested it on when I'm doing a, a compression. So you compress a, a folder, it's kind of the same action. As yeah, an yeah, that's true. So that's, a, yeah, that's yeah. kind of a that's, that's positive, but... That's detecting uh, the fact of encryption done, done on the disk. Eh? I thought you were more speaking about a user who sees what is happening. No, no, no. no. oh, no, okay. Like an empty virus or something? Yeah, yes, something. There, yes, there are several uh, tools like that. For example, looking at the entropy uh, of a file. Okay. Eh? Uh, an, a Word document would, for example, have an entropy uh, if, if, it is, if it doesn't contain a lot of pictures. Eh? But uh, a normal Word, yeah. 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 But, 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 but that is an example with one key. Eh? I mean, there is a huge amount of ransomware, so they they uh, gather a lot of money, so they have a lot of time to do research. Eh? Uh, and you will, for example, also find a ransomware that uses a unique key per file that it encrypts. And that file, sorry, that key that is used for the encryption of that key is stored in, in that file, but then encrypted with the public key uh, of the ransomware authors. Yeah? And typically then, if you need to recover something, they will f ask you to send them the key, sorry, the file, the ransom files, where they will recover the key and then decrypt it for you. But um, that, that's a, uh, an example eh, that they give you, okay, we are able to, to decrypt it. But, but in that case, it's, uh, it's already much more difficult to, to recover the keys. Also, um, yeah? So I would, I would guess that if they use multiple keys, it actually undermines their like, business because you would ha probably have to install like an application that will for you select every file that has been encrypted with that specific key. Yeah, so the, the, the yeah. point is that it, that it makes this, you uh, encrypt the files using symmetric keys, so it generates keys, but you encrypt the key itself with public yeah, key yeah, encryption, I'm, so I'm, you, only, yeah, you don't need connection with the server that, anymore. But as soon as you get them to restore in your file, so you pay it like the 500 yeah. you euros, need the secret key, yeah. and yeah, you need one key, but will a normal user go through the whole process I mean of like selecting. Itself, right? well, yeah. You just have to put yeah. a secret key into the program. Yeah. The, the, but the program is already there. It, that's, a, that, yeah, that's, a, that's, often the, that's often the ransomware itself. Eh? Oh, also, uh, uh, what ransomware also often does is leave behind a message. Eh? For example, change your background or put a readme note on your desktop or things like that to, to warn you. Eh? And then um, we can... We can talk uh, a lot about that, eh? uh, about ransomware, because it's very uh, prevalent for the moment. But um, also now you have ransomware that will not encrypt your files immediately. Eh? It will try to stay resident on your system and then uh, only start to encrypt it after a couple of weeks. And you have also ransomware that is even more insidious. It will only encrypt files that you didn't use recently. And then, uh, over uh, lapses of time, in the end it will have encrypted everything. Eh? But in the first step, it will not encrypt files that you are using actively, so that in the beginning you don't see that it is there. It will try to stay hidden for some time, but then of course, after a time, it has to make itself public so that it can ransom you. Eh? So, it's a very uh, complex situation. I, I once had the opportunity had to help somebody who was, uh, whose, whose pictures have been ransomed, and that was because of the ransomware. It did not encrypt the complete file. It just encrypted uh, a header, for example, the first thousand bytes. Yeah? And uh, he, he gave me a, a file like that, and I saw, okay, the beginning uh, has a very high entropy, uh, looks encrypted, but then after about 1,000 bytes, I could see structures that you would find in a JPEG file. And so by reconstructing the header, 
by using one of the pictures that was not encrypted on the image machine, we could recover uh, the files, the pictures. But, but that was a lucky shot, eh? I mean, it's because they didn't do their job well from a point of view uh, of criminals. Eh? They only encrypted part of the file. Eh? And then that person also had to find somebody uh, who could help him eh? because most users will not be able to, to do that. And also um, those picture recovery programs. Uh, in those cases, they will uh, often also not recognize that there is a picture inside. I, I recognized it because uh, I made a graph of the, of the entropy, and uh, that wasn't a straight line. <laughs> so the CryptoLocker example, the user will receive an email, will click on a, a link, go to the website, which will download then the ransomware, and the ransomware will then encrypt local and network files. It can also be that it will encrypt your network files. So on network shares, find files and also encrypt them. Trojans. So for example, this is a, a Trojan on mobile malware. It's a game. And uh, that's, that happens a lot with uh, Trojans on uh, Android. It's actually a game, but it will also send out SMSs uh, that will cost you a lot. Or other Trojans that uh, try to get your tokens for uh, banking. Now the fraud here for the Zeus uh, malware is, is quite complex because here we are not dealing with bitcoins. <laughs> we are dealing with uh, real money. So the criminals at some point in time, they uh, need to get their hands on the cash, which in our environment, um, in our banking environment becomes more and more difficult. So what will uh, typically be done is working with uh, money mules. So that, those uh, are people that they have recruited in, uh, in for example, work at home scheme. Uh, they, they will not tell those people that they will actually be part of a, of a banking attack. Huh? They actually tell the people, okay, you, you will work from home. And what they typically have to do is in the country where the attack will take place, those people will be asked to open bank accounts. And then all the money that is stolen, stolen is transferred from the bank into those bank accounts in, in that country. Yeah. The people here, the money mules, their instruction is also to regularly withdraw the money from the bank accounts. And then they get to keep some part. That's uh, their pay, for example, 10%. Yeah. And the 90% is then transferred to the fraudulent company. Uh, uh, for example, with those uh, money wire services. Yeah. But typically outside of the country. And when all this here is uh, discovered by law enforcement, law enforcement, enforcement, sorry. And when they intervene, they will typically end up with those people here that have been misled. Yeah. And those people will be put in jail because of their actions as money mules, but then all the other criminals here outside of the country, they are much harder to find. Yeah. So that is typical for uh, banking fraud if they want to recover the money, they need a way to get it out of the country, which is typically done with money, mule, money mules, uh, like those uh, work-at-home schemes. Uh, earn a couple of thousand uh, dollars per week by working at home, uh, or just uh, accepting payments and uh, checking that the payments are okay or something like that. Uh, they, 
they make you believe it's kind of uh, secretarial work, that you are actually transferring money. Like I said, they have a global reach. Uh, they are all over the planet. So we are here uh, again. We saw the different types of, of malware. Um, we know that we could have malware, so now we are going to decide to analyze or not. And uh, that could be a strange idea that you have to decide that, but uh, the fact is you will not always have the sample. Uh, um, typically, antivirus will find the file and delete it for you, and then you no longer have it. Okay, so already hard to, uh, to analyze. It will sometimes, if you configure it, it will put it in a quarantine folder uh, so that the file will be quarantined. So a copy of that file will be made, but it will be rendered uh, harmless, that it can no longer execute. Hmm? Then you can recover it from uh, the quarantine file. Now, recovering for it from the quarantine file is not also always that easy because when you restore something from the quarantine file, you often also tell to the antivirus, okay, I trust this file. And you can put it back and you no longer have to protect me because of that file. I, I trust that file. That's some of the actions that you actually do when you restore a quarantine file, a quarantined file. So that's also not the best of options. The, the best thing you can do is to get it yourself from the quarantine file, if you know how it is uh, encoded. Uh, I know a couple, of, uh, a couple of encoding methods that the antivirus uh, companies uh, use. Uh, for example, McAfee will just XOR the sample with, uh, with a single key. Sometimes you can recover other artifacts by doing an incident response, so analyzing the system. And then finally, uh, you get to, uh, to analyze the malware. But also, like I said, this will cost you time and money, so often you will not do a full analysis of the malware. Uh, you will only do a partial uh, analysis. Now, the thing nowadays, the best thing you can start with is uh, online research. Eh? Try to find antivirus companies or researchers or other, other people who have encountered the same thing as you and have written that up on the internet. Eh? So for example, uh, mailing lists. There are a lot of private uh, mailing lists uh, discussing all kinds of malware. IOC uh, repositories. Uh, IOC, that's indicator of compromise. Uh, so, for example, uh, a URL or an MD5 hash. Uh, if you find that in your environment, that's an indicator of compromise. And if you go into th those repositories, you can then find back which malware you're dealing with and maybe get a, an idea of what it does. Uh, so, for example, VirusTotal. I don't know if you know the site. Uh, if you submit a file to VirusTotal, it will scan that file with about 58 different uh, antivirus engines, and they will all tell you if they detect something or not. Uh, but that's not all that antivirus, uh, that uh, VirusTotal does for you. It does a lot of things more. For example, if you know where to look in additional information, it will also tell you when it, when it was first submitted to the sample, and when it was last submitted, and how many times it has been submitted. So if you have something that you uh, think is suspicious, but no antivirus detects it for the moment, but it is something that has been submitted a couple of days ago and was only s seen the first time a couple of days ago, uh, that's also an indication that uh, you're dealing with something suspicious. Yeah. You also have sites that will uh, do uh, more detailed analysis. Yeah?
write the malware, you can just submit your own sample to various people and see if um, someone has, or if some malware analyst has already um, researched it. So no, so, no, they will do it. They will do something else. If they do that, they will do something else. They will not submit their sample, but they will search VirusTotal for the first appearance of their sample and then know that somebody has discovered them. And um, that is why I will often not submit a sample to VirusTotal, but I will search for the sample on VirusTotal. And if I don't find it, then I will decide if I submit it or not. Uh, if it could be, for example, an indication of a targeted attack, uh, something that is directed to the, and only directed to the organization I work for, then I will probably not submit that sample. But it's a good point. Um, everybody can see this, so everybody can follow this. And also, uh, you can get paid subscriptions from them. And with those paid subscriptions, you can look up m much more information, and you can even download samples. And then uh, other blocks, for example, secure lists, that's from Kaspersky, uh, which gives you here detailed information about their analysis, how the code uh, of the malware works. Now, if we go back here, analysis, you can mainly divide the types of different analysis that you can do into static analysis and uh, dynamic analysis. Static analysis, you will only look at the code and try to understand what the code does. That's in essence what uh, static analysis is. So you will not execute the malware. While dynamic analysis, you will try to execute the malware and then observe its behavior and see uh, what it does. Often, you will, you will uh, use both uh, techniques. Uh, you will, in reverse engineering, it's not a science. Huh? Uh, when you are stuck somewhere, you often try out a new technique to get the ideas of what the malware is doing to help you continue with, uh, the, with, uh, with the analysis you are stuck with. So you have static and dynamic uh, analysis. The thing about dynamic analysis is that, and, and actually also about analysis in general, is that they will try to make your life more difficult as, a, as an analyst. Right? They will uh, make sure that it's harder to understand what the malware does. In uh, static analysis, they will use obfuscation and encryption. Obfuscation is, for example, adding a lot of meaningless code, uh, code that actually doesn't contribute to uh, the malicious execution, but is just there uh, for you to have more work in your analysis. While in dynamic analysis, where we are going to run the malware to see its behavior, this is typically something that you will do in a virtual machine or in a sandbox. Yeah? Well, at that time, the malware will try to detect that it is running in such an environment, and if it detects it, it will change its behavior. For example, it will do nothing. That's what it uh, often does. A simple example. Um, up till recently, virtual machines and sandboxes, especially those used for malware analysis, they just had a CPU with one core. That's all that was needed for the analysis. Yeah? There is malware that in the beginning will check how many cores that you have. And if you have only one core, it will do nothing. Okay. So, in dynamic analysis, you will uh, run and analyze the application in a sandbox, while for static analysis, you will analyze the code of the application. But uh, it's also something, that, as I said, that you can combine. For example, you run the application in a sandbox. With, it's heavily obfuscated, and you run it in a sandbox. And then you have the executable in memory. It is running in memory. And most of the time, when it is obfuscated or packed or encrypted, in memory, it is no longer obfuscated. 
uh, in memory, it is clear code. But there are exceptions, huh? but there is clear code. So then the idea is to dump the memory and then analyze the code that you find in memory. So for static analysis, uh, decide how you're going to uh, do the analysis. It depends, for example, how it was uh, compiled. Uh, if it was compiled, uh, if it was uh, with a C compiler, with Java, or JavaScript, that is something you will need to de uh, um, determine to know how you can proceed with your uh, dy uh, static analysis. And like I said, there are different uh, anti-analysis techniques like packing. So packing is uh, a kind of compression that is applied to the executable so that not only does the executable become uh, much smaller, but also because of the obscure type of compression they are doing, it, it's uh, no longer readable. And you have to be able to unpack it. Obfuscated, um, like I said, that is when superfluous code is added. And anti-debugging techniques, that's, for example, the core, the, extra, the, the core detection that is done. So what packers will uh, typically do, they will compress the executable. And by doing this also, of course, the executable changes and the uh, cryptographic hashes also uh, change. This one here will just do some kind of compression. Uh, a popular one is uh, UPX. Uh, that's one where you can even find a tool to decompress it. Uh, but many of them lack decompressors. And then you also have uh, packers that not only compress, but also obfuscate and, and protect the code. For example, if you make changes to the code to help you with your debugging, that they detect that change and that they no longer uh, operate. What I will uh, typically do uh, with static analysis, when, when, when I'm dealing with scripts, eh, like in, uh, in macros, then uh, I'm kind of lucky because in, uh, in VBA, the uh, analysis is much easier to do. Uh, there's less ways of, uh, of obfuscating and uh, anti-debugging techniques that they can apply than they would be able to do with the Windows executable. Just looking at the strings that are in a malware, eh, just uh, sequences of text characters, can sometimes also tell you uh, what it will do. Uh, for example, if you are lucky, you will find a URL in, uh, in that malware. Then you have these assemblers and the compilers, and uh, we'll see a short demo. Dynamic analysis, even more tools debuggers, emulators. Now, the typical thing about emulators is that they will not actually execute your code. They, uh, they will emulate it. Different tools, like Kuko, that's a, a known sandbox. Wireshark for network analysis. I capture the traffic and uh, look at the network traffic. Process monitor to see ev all the changes that have, are done to the Windows machine. VMware to execute in a safe environment, FireEye 2. Okay. So, that was a very quick overview of the different analysis techniques you have for malware. And now I'm going to show you how I proceed with static analysis of a, a malicious PDF document. Now, it's a malicious PDF document with an exploit also, it's uh, something quite old, uh, several years old uh, that I made. And, and the reason that I took something old is that it doesn't actually have to contain a lot of code to bypass all the new protections that have been put in place, like data execution protection uh, and ASLR and all those things. And, uh, those, that code is uh, much 
more difficult to, to understand, so I took a simpler one. In the slides, which will be available, available I also took uh, screen, screenshots of the different steps, like this here. But let's take a look now. So I have here my PDF. This one is actually a, a special PDF that I prepared. Sorry, I'm, on a, I'm not on a Windows machine. It's actually a, a pure text uh, PDF file. And uh, I also added a lot of pretty printing so that you would be able uh, to read it. But somewhere in here, you see, there is JavaScript in this uh, PDF. Now, JavaScript in a PDF is not a problem in itself. It is sandboxed. It has no access to the resources of your machine. But if it finds exploits, then it can get access to those resources. And that is what is done here. So, typically, you will run first a tool that will do a quick analysis of that PDF. And here, for example, this one here, JavaScript 1, it tells me that this PDF contains JavaScript. <coughs> when you have a PDF that you suspect to be malicious and you know that it contains JavaScript, well, that's one of the first things you are going to look at, the JavaScript. Here, the JavaScript, we could just type it out like this here. But typically, this will also be uh, compressed. And not because of obfuscation, but because that's how uh, normal PDFs work. Uh, they, all the information is binary and uh, compressed. And in that case, you just need a tool, PDF parser, where you can search for JavaScript in that file, and then it will select it out for you. Now, this here is a complete exploit. It's something old, eh? from 2009 or 2008, uh, I believe. Util print F, there was a bug in there. If you would print this large number with this formatting with a large, um, with a large field, yeah, then you would trigger a bug. And the special thing about that bug is that you would get an, uh, an exception, a memory access ex exception. The Adobe Reader tries to execute code at a location where there is no code. That's what this, this bug triggers. Okay. What this code triggers that bug. Now, as a malware author or an exploit writer, what you want to do then, okay, it tries to execute code at a location that is not there. Right? There is no code at lo that location. So what am I going to do as a malware author? I'm going to put my code at that location. And then it will execute. And that is what is done here before the bug is triggered here, you have these loops here. They will fill the memory with shell code. I, I'm not going to go into detail how this works with the shell code, but this is the shell code that is actually encoded. And so this is actually Unicode encoding that allows you to encode all kinds of Unicode uh, strings in JavaScript. And this is actually used here in this case to encode machine code. Uh, this is machine code, the shell code. And in those loops here, I'm not going to talk about an obslet, but in those loops here, the shell code is copied into memory by assigning variables in an array. And those variables are stored in the heap of the machine, and that is why this, is, this technique is called heap spraying. You fill the heap, you spray the heap full of code. And once your uh, heap is full of code, then you trigger your bug, and you hope that it executes your code. Right? Because of the knobslets here, 
that probability is rather high. So as an analyst, you will probably recognize this. If you don't, you see also here the name shellcode, so that's another indication. So you want to decode this. There's a way with a tool here that I made. This tool here will look for all kinds of uh, encodings and then try to decode them. So I set here with PU, uh, look for percent U encoding. So it searches in the output, uh, I piped it from this tool into this tool, it searches for all percent U encodings and if it finds something, it will decode it for you. So here the first one it finds is uh, 1014 bytes. And uh, this is part of the code, this is the MD5. I can select this one, so I select one, and I do a ASCII dump, okay? And this is the shell code. You know, probably you cannot make any sense of it, but uh, at the end you can still see a string that is uh, readable. Uh, often shell code will contain uh, readable strings, and this here uh, is an indication that this shell code is actually a proof of concept that will launch calculator. Eh? Launching calculator for proof of concepts. <laughs> That's the way to go. Eh? So that is my shell code. I will dump this to a file. So not an ASCII dump, but a real binary dump to a file. Shellcode.vir. And now, here, this file, I can open it with a disassembler. And I have a screenshot of that. So that is that shell code that is uh, disassembled. Uh, trying to understand this, even if you know a uh, machine language, uh, you need to know a bit about how shell code operates to be able to understand it. Because shell code is special. Shell code will execute at any position that it is, and also, it does not link to functions that it needs. It will search for the functions itself that it needs. So that's something you need to understand. If you want to analyze it like this here, by just looking at the code. But fortunately, there are other tools like a shellcode emulator. Now the shellcode emulator that I'm going to use, SCDBIG, um, it exists for Windows and it exists for Linux and OS X, but the Windows version has much more features than the other ones, so I prefer to use the Windows versions. And I'm using the Windows version here with Wine on uh, my Mac. Okay? I just have to give it an option that I'm telling it, I'm giving, it you a I'm giving you a file that contains a shellcode. This is the shellcode, and then it will emulate it, okay. which it did here. And it, if you just like let it run like that uh, without, any, um, without any other options, for example, be more verbose, eh, just like that, it will tell you what calls it does to the operating system. Eh? And it does a call to WinExec. WinExec is a, an API call to execute an executable. The executable it will execute is calc.exe. And after that, it just exits the thread. So the thread exits and uh, is done running. Okay. This is emulation. Uh, it did not do the uh, winexec calc.exe. Eh? You see no calculator appearing here on my machine. So that is uh, an example of how in static analysis, eh, when some methods to analyze could take too much time or be too costly, uh, that you try some other ways, like for example using a this debugger here to try to understand what it does. Right? In the shell code, we already saw a string, and that's what I say. Sometimes strings can help you a lot. If you see calc.exe, well, you can think it's a proof of concept. It's, it's actually shell code that I wrote. And here with the emulator, you can clearly see what it does. Okay. So I have the screenshots included. And then the second uh, analysis I want you to show, I want to show you is a decompiler. So you have the IDA Pro disassembler, and along with the IDA Pro disassembler, you can also get the hex race uh, decompiler. 
And what we are going to look at here is this piece of C code that I wrote, a very simple C code with a main. It, with the API, it tests if a debugger is present, and if a debugger is present, I'm not going to do anything. So that's a simple uh, trick to try to bypass dynamic analysis. If that debugger is not present, I will download the file, this location, and I will execute it. Typically, what I did here is also what malware authors will do. They will not uh, care about the return code of those functions. Right? They will not check if the download succeeded before they try to execute them. Those checks are not done in malware. So that is my C code. And I, now I can start my IDA Pro disassembler. It's software that you have to buy, and it is expensive. And then I open here, that's my executable, malware anti-debug, I called it. I open it. It will tell me that it is probably a portable executable, a PE file. That's a, the file format that is used by Windows now for executables. So we are going to take that. It also detected that I left in a link to a debug information. But of course, that debug information is not here, so we cannot use that. Otherwise, it will try to use it. OK. And now it did the analysis, which you would be able to see here. But I know it's too small. Let me go to the slides. And there maybe you uh, will be able to read it better. So you have the main function here, and then you have a call to is debugger present. A test is made to see if AEX, that register, is zero or not. Because API calls in Windows will typically return their uh, return value in the AEX register. If that register is not zero, then we jump to this location. And here we just end. Otherwise, we push information on the stack, like the file name and the URL, do a URL download to file. Then we push other in information on the stack, and we do a shell execute. Okay. That's assembly code. Just a small bit of assembly code, uh, still not that easy to understand. That is a disassembler, but with this disassembler, I also have a decompiler. And I can say open subview, generate pseudo code with a couple of warnings. And then it will generate this pseudo code for me. So again, I'm sorry it's too small, so I'm going to go to the slides here. And here you can see the main function, the if test, and the URL download to file, and the shell execute. Okay, so uh, such a decompiler can help you a lot to try to understand. Eh? Uh, you, if you're not familiar with uh, assembly code and it is written in C, then this C decompiler can help you. Now, remark also that things like a define are no longer present here. Eh? They are literals here. That's because defines here are substituted in the code by the C preprocessor. Eh? So that's also information that you lose. And also, it's not immediately obvious here, but a lot of that code that is generated by the decompiler will use a lot of pointers and uh, indirections. It's, it's harder to read than uh, normal C code. Okay, so that was a quick demo of uh, analysis of a malicious document or uh, analysis of an executable. Now, we have partially, most of the time it will only be partially, partially analyzed our malware, and we know what it did. 
we have a good idea what it is. So now we take action. Uh, first of all, uh, make a report for in case that you ever have to use that in other circumstances. For example, that the malware reappears, uh, that you can just consult your report and not have to go back doing the same analysis again. Or uh, this is also information that you could share with other uh, analysts. Also keep uh, an internal repository of those samples uh, that you always have access to them. Uh, remember, you typically will not do a full analysis, but maybe later on it could be uh, necessary to continue that analysis. So keep a repository. And then about that machine that was infected, what are, what are we going to do uh, about that machine? And, and there again, I reflect on, uh, on CIA. Eh? What did the malware actually do to that machine in terms of uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability? And then, typically, you decide how to clean the machine or else rebuild the machine. I typically recommend... Uh, rebuilding the machine, especially if you are uh, in a corporate environment which has some kind of procedure to do that. Uh, and the reason is malware will not only do its uh, malicious actions, but often it will interfere with all kinds of security systems that you have on your machines. Like, for example, tamper with the antivirus, uh, disable the antivirus. Hmm? But it will not uh, disable the antivirus by flagging... Uh, <laughs> the checkbox, no more antivirus, uh, it will typically mess up the configuration or even patch the executables so that it doesn't actually do uh, its proper job no longer. And if you want to clean that up, then again, you have to know exactly what it did to the antivirus and then be able to reverse that operation. Huh? So that's often quite complex to do. Uh, for example, I, I saw malware that would just look for all services that contained strings that are typical for antivirus, eh? try to detect antivirus and uh, firewalls and things like that, I mean host firewalls, and then it would just erase all the registry settings of uh, those services. Eh? So if you don't have a backup, it would already be quite some work to rebuild all of that, uh, to rest restores to all of that. So that's why I often say uh, rebuilding is a better option, especially in the long run. Uh, if you do it often, it will be streamlined and your rebuilding process will not only be a process that you can use in case of uh, malware infection, but also with other incidents. Uh, for example, a broken laptop, a stone laptop, things like that. And then Another action could be that you uh, recommend, that you make recommendations to the other security teams. For example, how to better protect uh, the environment uh, you are in, and so to apply more uh, defense. And sometimes also be uh, proactive, that you sometimes can get an idea what the next step will be, that the malware authors will do, and then already protect yourself, your company, your organization against those next steps. So to wrap up, so that is a, a short informal cycle. Eh? You are informed that malware is detected. You decide to analyze or not. You analyze the malware and then you take action. So measures uh, to take home, not, uh, not very positive ones, but for the moment, uh, you can find malware almost everywhere. It's a, it's a big problem. And also, you don't have the time and resources to analyze all that malware in depth in your organizations. Eh? You have to decide what to analyze, manage your resources. So it's necessary to make smart use of your time and resources. For example, by relying on existing information and looking up online what is already known about that malware. And then also what I like to do, if uh, I'm wondering what happened here, actually what 
what uh, malicious actions were taken is to take that uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability into account and uh, see what things were made to those parameters. Okay. Still questions? Yep. That, that, can, that can be very different upon the uh, organizations uh, you work in. For example, I've worked for a long time in an organization where um, there was segregation of duty uh, in the IT systems, and uh, people who did incident response and malware analysis did not get access to uh, servers, for example, or workstations where the incident happened. Yeah, and so it was an administrator or sometimes uh, someone from the help desk who had to access uh, that machine and, uh, and recover that malware and give it to us. And, and that is why um, I'm illustrating here that it's not always easy when you have a detection to actually get uh, the sample and start working. See? The, and this is also something that can be helped a lot with the right tools uh, because you can also have antivirus systems that will centralize all the quarantine files and put it in a central repository where you can have a look, where you don't need to go out to those machines. Uh, so that is something uh, that uh, has to be taken into account. Eh? As an experienced analyst, you can give a lot of recommendations to, to prepare the environment to not only help you with uh, the analysis, but also help you with the recovery. Yeah, detection, detection a lot, yeah. The a good thing that couldn't be put in, in the architecture is actually not something like antivirus detection, uh, where you look for known bad stuff but uh, more ano anomaly uh, detection. And anomaly, I'm speaking about um, decent anomaly uh, detection uh, that detects malicious uh, anomalies. Mm -hmm. And that, for example, uh, looks at the interactions between different machines and servers. And if it see strange patterns, that could, for example, indicate a chain of uh, infection, that that would also uh, alert us. And also, um, a lot of instrumentation uh, for applications and for uh, systems. The more logs and informations uh, we have, the more uh, we are capable to uh, reconstruct what actually happened. But that, and that is not only for malware analysis, also for incident response and forensics. Huh? Uh, for example, I always recommend uh, just to run Sysmon on your machines. Uh, it's a tool from Sysinternals. It will monitor a lot of your machine, what, it, what happens on your machine. For example, it will monitor the execution of each executable and write a hash uh, in the event log. Uh, and just having that running on a machine helps already a lot. Even if, if it is not centralized, eh? just having that information that you non otherwise would never have. Okay, thank you.